Uh, hey guys, so I'd like to thank you all for turning out. I know some of you are in uh, time zones where it's not exactly an optimal time for you, but thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Luke Dickin, and I'm going to be telling you about uh, what I've been doing for the last uh, two and a half, three years uh, with my PhD. And uh, at the end, we can have a wee decide whether I should just uh, submit my application to McDonald's just now. Um, so if I can get this to advance to the next slide, there we go. Oh, so just a quick slide on who I am. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, I've already got a Bachelor of Science with Honours, a Master of Science, and a Master of Research with Distinction, uh, all in AI or things related to AI. Uh, I'm a founding member of the Strathclyde AI and Games Research Group. I write for AltDev Blogger Day, which is pretty much how I ended up uh, speaking here. And uh, just last week, I found out that I'm the recipient of the 2012 Eric Dibson uh, Memorial AI Scholarship, so I'll be attending GDC. Um, so that's sort of who I am, so the rest of it is content, I promise. So I want to address first off a bit of a motivation about uh, why I'm doing this work. So starting from a, an academic point of view, for the first six months of my PhD, I sort of... Uh, was trying to find ways that we could make AI that could play Ms. Pac-Man. Um, so that was a very depressing time in my life. Um, I really don't like to talk about it too much. Um, needless to say that I started having dreams about Pac-Man and hearing the noises in my sleep, and it, it was just really, really bad times. Um, but what's interesting about Pac-Man is that it has non-deterministic ghosts, and what that means is that we have unpredictable behavior. So if we can't predict what the ghosts are going to do, then we're in a position where we can't sort of uh, exploit that knowledge. So if we, as the Pac-Man agent, are trying to maximize our score, the first thing we need to be able to do is stay alive. We need to get around the maze and clear pills, and that means we need efficient path planning. So we need to be maximizing the way that we're utilizing our time in the game. And at the same time, we need to make effective use of the power pills. So you collect a power pill, and the four ghosts that are chasing you become edible. Once they're edible, you can then uh, eat them, I guess. That's what edible means. Um, but the point is that just collecting one pill in the maze gives you uh, a score of 10. If you eat a ghost, a blue ghost, the first one gives you 200. If you can then go on to the next one, that's 400, and then it, each one it doubles. So by the time you've uh, done with one power pill, if you've done it effectively, you've got a huge score bump that you wouldn't have got uh, just by eating the pills. So what we're talking about really is, is this kind of conflict between long-term deliberative reasoning and short-term reaction to the dynamic environment. So if we were uh, reactive, if we, we were just reacting to the environment, then we might be able to have a very sort of long life, we might be able to survive well in the maze, but we're not maximizing our potential around uh, that um, time. We're not actually doing something useful. Being purely deliberative means that we can maximize our score, so we're going to get a decent score uh, out of running around the maze. But because we're going to die quickly, that means that our score is actually going to be capped at some level. So we'll have an efficient score, but not a large score. And sort of this distinction between reaction and deliberation comes down to this uh, concept. Now, I've forgotten where I got this uh, this quote from. I picked it up a few years ago, and uh, I've used it loads of times since, and uh, I've not been able to find where it came from. But the idea is that when you put your hand on a hot stove, you don't need to know what time it is in order to realize you've got to move your hand. So this is kind of the major distinction between reaction and deliberation. Reaction says, um, as soon as we know that we've got to do something, do it. Deliberation wants to take in all the inputs. It wants to assess all the options. It wants to sort of work out what's the best course of action, and then having decided that, it will then do it. So I'll come back to this uh, in a little bit, um, but what I really want with this section is just to highlight this contrast between the two. And then let's move on and let's ditch the academic stuff and talk about industry for a bit. So AI in games is mostly an open research topic, so we've got loads of solutions that are good enough. And uh, in a lot of cases, good enough is all we need, but we haven't got perfect solutions. There's always scope for improvement. 
So Battlefield Bad Company 2 is one of the examples uh, that sort of highlighted this for me. So this uh, is a, a talk that Michal Hedberg gave at the Paris Gaming Eye Conference in 2010. And the, the takeaway for me from that talk was that uh, the DICE were saying that the, the average lifespan for an enemy in Battlefield Bad Company 2 was going to be five seconds. Uh, so that's, uh, like I said, Hedberg in, in Paris. So how smart does something actually need to be in order to seem like it's acting intelligently for five seconds? So how good does good enough actually need to be in this case? And the idea is that it really isn't sort of having to be that good. But when we move on to talking about these guys, so uh, Alex from Half-Life 2 or one of the Star Wars companions or any of these sort of guys who are going to stay with you, well, we know that they're going to exist for a lot longer than five seconds. They're going to be kicking around the world for most of the game. And we end up in this situation where the perception of intelligence becomes a lot more important. So if we've got a system that can generate sort of uh, reasonably reliable sort of uh, behaviors that look intelligent for five seconds, is that necessarily going to work for a companion? So this is the kind of thing that uh, you might be talking about when you talk about uh, characters in games. This is a behavior tree. I've shamelessly ripped this off from Beyond's work uh, on uh, Alt-Dev Blogger Day. I seriously suggest you go read his articles because uh, they sort of explain things very clearly for me. Um, but what we've got is we've got a uh, uh, wrong mouse. We've got a top level uh, priority selector and then we've got selectors up down here and then we've actually got sort of actions and uh, things happening at a very low level. So behavior trees are kind of considered to be one of the states of the art in game AI right now. And uh, I'm not going to do much more on them because Alex is going to cover them in detail tomorrow uh, in this same time slot, 7 o'clock GMT. Um, but the point of, that I, I'm sort of got from behavior trees is that really it's still an authored approach. It's still a, a system where we have to create behaviors. And what the tree is really doing is it's kind of looking at what's available to it and stopping and starting the behaviors as things change in the world and as things uh, become appropriate to, to fire off, off they go. But we're going to have this situation where we've got these characters that are going to be kicking around for a long time. And the thing about players is that we can't predict what they're going to do. We like to think we can, but we can't. So this is a, a prime example of the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Uh, you have a, a character who's manning a shop, um, and uh, he's... Uh, got all the things in his shop and if he can see them, if he's got a line of sight on the thing in his shop, then he knows he's stealing it. Um, so the way that players came up with to get around this was to stick a bucket on his head. It breaks the line of sight and then you can nick his stuff. So really this is kind of um, a, a key example that shows that the play is inherently emerging. And what we're doing by sort of creating these authored behaviors is that we're trying to predict the kind of emergence that's going to come. So with hindsight now, we can say, okay, well, we know that this bucket on head thing is going to happen. So we can build a behavior that will compensate for that. But players do weird things, and we can't sort of have this uh, retroactive approach to sort of um, compensating for what they're doing, because we can't actually come up with what they're going to do next. So the key thing is that really some situations are going to require more robust intelligence, more robust perception of intelligence at least. And sort of what I sort of decided was that this kind of highlights that we need to go beyond this concept of pre-made behaviors and um, you know behavior trees, finite state machines, all this kind of we're going to decide what the character is going to do. It's okay as long as you can control what the, how the player interacts with that character. If you can't control that or if you, you sort of can't control it so well, then we kind of need to be able to be a bit more adaptive and have novel solutions to situations. So uh, previous approaches have sort of tried to compensate for this by combining reaction and uh, automated planning. And what they then do is they kind of swap between them. So they have some aspects of the world that are going to be handled by the reactive layer, and then they have others that are going to be handled by the planning layer. 
So if we go back to the um, the most Pac-Man example, uh, typically, so we, we had a, a, a situation, or sorry, an architecture that, that worked like this. And what happened was that while ever the ghosts were far enough away, everything was handled by planning. The ghosts would try and navigate the maze in an efficient way. And once uh, the ghosts got close to the player, then we swapped into the reactive layer and we had to react to the fact that the ghosts were present. And it's okay, it's not, it's not ideal, but the thing about that is it seems really unsubtle. Basically, you just swap in a lever and say, okay, now I'm in planning, now I'm in reaction. And it, it just doesn't seem like a, an elegant way of switch, <coughs> excuse me, of switching between. So essentially what I've been trying to do is come up with a way that we can arbitrate between the two. We can sort of uh, take reaction and take planning and smush them together rather than having them as two separate things that we swap between. So coming back to this quote, um, so when you put your hand on a hot stove, you don't need to know what time it is in order to realize you've got to move your hand. Okay, fair enough. So what I'm trying to add in and, and what my work is really centered around is the next sentence of that. But you might find it useful to move your hand in the direction of the first aid kit. And that's kind of the key concept of what I'm trying to do. So I think now I'm just going to move straight on to talking about how I've been doing that. So on to the theory. So pretty much all of this hinges on getting reaction and deliberation to speak the same language. If we can get them to talk to each other, then we can start trying to do uh, niftier things and just swapping between the two. So initially in my PhD was with uh, the Strathclyde Planning Group, uh, which was a, a, in its time, it's closed now, but at the time it was a, a world leading automated planning kind of uh, research team. And because of that, uh, I sort of have a bit of a planning spin on everything. But a typical representation of a deliberative problem is in this thing called the planning domain description language, uh, or PDDL. So for those of you who've not seen PDDL before, it's a first order logic. And what it does really is it describes interactions available within the game world, or within any world, within the planning world. Um, you provide the initial state of the world in this logic. You provide a list of facts that have to hold true for a state to be considered a goal state, and you throw it into a planning system, and it figures out the list uh, of actions you need to do between the two. Um, so let's say we've got some simple little problem that we're going to play about with, uh, just so that we've got nice pictures on a slide. Um, so this is a this is a driver log. Uh, this is a common problem that we hack around with in planning. And what we've got is we've got a little dude, and the little dude drives the truck, and uh, we've got a package. So the package goes, can be loaded into the truck. In order to move the truck, the dude has to be driving the truck. The truck can go around the motorways. The guy can't walk on the motorway. He has to walk through the park to get between the locations. And if we were to represent that in PDDL, it looks a bit like this. Um, so that is actually the initial state for that situation that I just showed you there. Um, so each one of these are individual facts. And what we end up with is, is seeing that the world state is represented as a high dimensional binary tuple. Uh, and what that means is that every fact is either true or false. Um, and we need to know the value of every fact in order to have a complete uh, enumeration of the world state. From previous work, we know that, the, that another representation exists, and we call this the Simple Action Structures Plus, or SAS Plus. Uh, and what that gives us is a low dimension uh, system with multi-valued variables. So what we do is we use uh, mutually exclusive analysis, and using that, we can translate automatically from PDDL into this SAS Plus representation. So we can start out in the uh, language that the planner uses, and we can move into something that some other planning systems use, but uh, we'll do something else within a bit. So the concept of this is things like uh, if we say that at truck 1 S0 and at truck 1 S1, the, in PDDL these are two facts that can be true or false. And we know that they can't be true at the same time because um, implicitly just by looking at, at the description we can say as humans, well, the truck can't be in two places at once. But uh, it's important to note that that can actually be derived 
uh, from the description of the world. So we can derive that just by doing some uh, first order logic monkeying about. So if we collect all the mutually, mutually exclusive facts into a single variable, then we can get uh, a variable out that the value of the variable reflects which of those facts is true. And that's going to look something like this. So we would take all the apps for the truck and we can shove them all together and it becomes a variable called location truck one that is drawn from S0, S1, S2 and all the other locations in the world that the truck can get to. So that's come from uh, a guy called Malta Helmut who uh, put it together for his planning system called Downwards. So all this uh, translation already exists and that's the uh, reference there for that. The key concept though is that in SAS Plus we don't just get a list of the values that the variable can take, but because we've also got the actions that we can use in the domain, then we get uh, a notion of how the variable is going to change its value, how things are going to move around the world. And from this we can uh, build up a graph, and the graph shows us what the transitions within the world are going to be, which variable value can swap to what other value, um, and we call that a domain transition graph. So if we think about the driver, then we can see that the driver can move from a location to a park, from a park back to a location. So this is showing the values that he can take and also how he can transition around the graph. Equally, the truck, we said that the truck can only go on the motorway, so the motorway it connects this guy to this guy, so he can drive around pretty much any pair of locations. So these are straightforward. These are basically just uh, drawn from the little diagram I put up to begin with. What's more interesting is the next one, which is for the package. So we said that the package could be loaded into the truck and unloaded. So what we get is that the, at any location, the package can be loaded into the truck. The truck then moves about, but we don't care about that in this graph. And then the package is unloaded at any of these three locations. So this is a slightly different structure that's coming out that isn't actually apparent from the initial state of the world that I showed you a few slides ago. Um, <coughs> sorry, um, what a day to get a coffee. Um, right, okay, so um, the current world state is going to be the current value of each variable that we've just got in the SAS plus. Or if you're more of a sort of visual kind of person, what you can think of it is a, a cross section across all the graphs. And if you can uh, find the currently active node, then a cross section across all the currently active nodes gives you the current world state. What we can do with that is take the cross product of all the graphs. And if we do that, we get a single unified graph. Uh, and what that gives us is the entire world state. Um, so that's just a, a case of, of just well, it is just cross product of the graphs to get that. Um, and what we've just created from the PDDL representation through to the SAS plus through to this representation is a graph representing the entire search space. Now, I know there's some of you in the audience who uh, know quite a bit about AI and you probably sat there thinking, well, you're not going to be able to search that. You've just created an intractable problem for yourself. And in a way, you're right. But the point of this isn't that we're going to search it, we're going to do some other stuff with it. So it actually becomes uh, not too terrible to do. It's a little bit counterintuitive, though I will agree. Um, but what we've got now is we've got from PDDL to a representation that's showing adjacency of states. So leaving that there for just now, I just want to take a little detour into uh, a different technique. So this one is called influence maps. And influence maps are typically used in 2D grid worlds. Uh, and what they do is sort of tell you how good and bad locations in a, in a world are. So you might have uh, this location is really good, so we color it in red. And then influence maps sort of radiate out influence. Um, so, well, these guys are adjacent to the one that's really good, so they're quite good. Uh, these ones are adjacent to the ones that are quite good, so they're kind of good, uh, and so on, until we're here where we've got now a complete mapping of how we get to the red spot, essentially. We just keep going up this, uh, up this slope that we've generated. 
So a 2D grid world is what influence maps tend to be working in. And effectively, we can say that a 2D grid world is a well-behaved graph. Um, so each node is connected to uh, its four neighboring nodes, uh, and that's fine. We can also talk about influence maps in grid worlds that have got obstructions, or we can talk about influence maps in worlds that are not fully connected. They've got um, zones that you can't actually access. So it's not that tricky to see how we can take the concept of an influence map and shove it into this uh, conceptual map that we've just created of the entire uh, state space that the world can have. And when we do this, we call it an influence landscape. Uh, and OK, uh, I thought there was a reference there, but it's on the next slide, I think. Uh, so influence gets applied at specific nodes and uh, it spreads out across the network. So this is exactly the same as it worked in the influence map. We're going to use a, a cost sharing heuristic to propagate the influence back. And the way that we do that is kind of like uh, Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, but the key distinction is that in Dijkstra, you, you're typically looking for the shortest distance. You don't have to be. Uh, but, but that's generally the application of it. But uh, what we're looking for instead is highest influence. So we sort of uh, allow things to radiate out, and we're always taking the highest influence at a node. Uh, and there's the uh, reference for that. So this was presented at the AISB AI and Games Symposium uh, last year. Uh, so you can pick up a paper for that if you are so inclined. And it's important just uh, as we're sort of going along to, to note that this kind of landscape generation and propagating out the influence, what you can do with that is that you can state it instead of sort of having to track objects and all that kind of nonsense. You can just do it as matrices and vectors. And realistically then, you've got characteristics that make it implicitly sort of aligned with a single instruction multiple data kind of approach. Um, so uh, influence propagation actually just comes down to uh, multiplication of vector matrix together and, and shove it off. So you can actually just keep going with that. The, the reason that I bring that up is that what that means is this kind of uh, propagation of influence and all this kind of jazz, it's an excellent candidate for offloading onto vector coprocessors. So uh, you can write it into like CUDA, you could uh, stick it on an SPU. Uh, and that means that, particularly in the case of the SPU, Often games aren't making 100% utilization of SPUs at this point. And, and sorry, SPUs are synergistic processing units in the cell broadband engine in the PlayStation. Um, so that means that to an extent, there's free processing available if we can get into that kind of format. So OK, we've talked about uh, where the influence uh, goes and how it works. But where does influence actually come from? So in influence maps, we'd be talking about enemies repelling you or power-ups attracting you and this kind of thing where key things within the world are going to have a positive or a negative kind of uh, effect. It's essentially the same thing in influence landscapes, but it's the result of sensing and it's the result of reasoning rather than specific elements within the world. So environmental data is one thing that we're looking at. So this is uh, sensing that the agent can do as it's wandering around your game world. Uh, and what it can do basically is whenever it can detect something within the world, whenever you can sort of raycast and say, oh, I can see there's a fire over there, you can say, okay, fire bad, uh, and apply a negative influence. And then you've got your deliberative data. And your deliberative data should be coming from uh, your reasoning system. So because, again, I'm a, a kind of planning guy by uh, my uh, genealogy, my sort of uh, coming through as a student, I'm, a, I'm unfortunately a planner. Um, that's what I'm looking towards as a source of my deliberative data. So OK, we're going to get a plan. How are we going to apply that to a landscape? So when we get a plan, plans look like this. They uh, essentially say, here is a list of actions, and if you do all of these actions, then you will achieve your objectives. Um, so do A, do B, do C, and then you win. Um, so what we do know is that in a dynamic environment, plans aren't going to remain valid. Um, this is kind of one of the inherent major flaws with planning, is that it goes horribly, horribly wrong very quickly. Um, so 
we have unforeseen consequences of action. So we're in a position where, um, say, our, our robot, we move a little bit away from games towards more classical planning. Uh, we've got a little robot in a warehouse, and it needs to pick up a box. Well, when it comes right down to it, it could try and pick the box up and end up dropping it. Unforeseen consequence, we haven't actually budgeted in the plan for, for trying to pick the box up again. So we're off the plan. We need to fix it. And of course, as well as that, we can't predict what the player is going to do in our game world. So we've got this concept where we've got imperfect information. We know that things aren't going to be doing what we expect them to be doing. So the upshot is that if we try to plan from the start to the goal, we're going to be doing a lot of non-useful computation. And what we could do then is, is we could say, OK, well, what we're going to do is take each node in the plan, each action, and say, well, if this is a node in the plan, then it has influence. But what that would do is, is form a pretty inflexible view of what's going to happen. And you say, this is what must happen. Uh, you must pass through this node. You must pass through this node. You must pass through this node. It's not giving us the kind of flexibility that we really want out of a technique like this, because we know that the plan is going to be bad. We know that things aren't going to go right. And if we have inflexibility, we can't react to it. So really what we want is to get a plan that's going to inform us rather than enforce its will on us. And to do that, like I say, less rigid approach. But the, what we really need is to try and extract the plan's intent. And we're trying to get away from this do this, do this, do that, and into, well, what I'm trying to tell you to do is something like this. So let's have a quick look at how we can do things like that. So um, looks like we didn't fix the builds on this slide. So that's the reference for it. Um, I'll tell you about it in a minute. But this is uh, stuff that we published in the International Conference on Intelligent Data Engineering and Automated Learning uh, in 2010, so uh, a wee while ago now. Um, so you can pick up this after I've told you about it. Uh, so essentially, with a net <coughs> oh dear, sorry. Uh, with a graph network, we can apply clustering techniques to group nodes together. And if we were to use a fuzzy clustering technique, what we're going to find is nodes that we're going to tell you are important within the graph. Don't ask why for just now. It's on the next slide. Uh, or it's on this slide. Um, so these nodes are focal nodes. And these are the guys that lie between two clusters. Um, so we're finding the ones that we can't really classify as being in cluster A or cluster B. And saying, well, if you lie between two clusters, there's something significant about you. And the process that we use is, a, is an iterative algorithm. It actually stabilizes pretty quickly. Uh, but what we're doing is we're collecting together related nodes. And relation is based implicitly on uh, sort of distance. Uh, sorry, distance within the search space. There's no uh, actual dimensions within that space, so you can't say it's distance. Um, so I said that focal nodes are important. Uh, a little bit on why they're important. Um, they define uh, how you're going to transition from one cluster to the next. So I said from cluster A to cluster B. Let's change it about and say that one's blue and one's red. So what they're doing is they're providing a pretty good indicator of plan intent. Um, and they make a pretty good candidate for being the source of influence in this graph. So we know that these guys are going to tell you how to get between two clusters. So we can use them to radiate out the influence in the graph that we're going to generate uh, down the line. And what we're doing is we are looking then for the ones that the, so we can work out where the focal nodes are in the graph. We can then find the active focal nodes. And these are the ones that the planner has said, right, do this, do that, do the, do the other. Look at, so we look at what nodes that would pass through. And if it's a focal node, it's an active focal node. So that prevents us from applying influence on just any old random focal node. So OK, so this is where we're going to talk about red clusters and blue clusters. Um, so our clustering technique is going to give us a classification of which clusters specific focal nodes lie between. And what that means is that we can lift out a functional definition of what a node is going to achieve, what this focal node actually does. So if we say that we had red and blue clusters, then lying in between a red and blue cluster, we would have a purple, uh, a purple focal node, because it's 50% blue, 50% red, and we didn't classify it as either blue or red. 
And what that means is that we can then go and look for nodes that provide the same bridge between clusters. So if we find another purple focal node, then we can say, OK, well, that will actually give us the same overall site kind of effect as going through the one that we were trying to go through. So what we're going to be able to do is find better contingencies. We're going to be able to see different paths through the world where if we can't get to where we, the plan said we should go, we can actually see that there is a different way through. So I've been talking all along about plans uh, going horribly, horribly wrong. Um, why is that a problem? Well, planning in general is a uh, complexity class P space complete. And uh, I wouldn't blame you if you'd never heard of P space complete because I hadn't when I started out doing planning. Um, but it is very much on the tough end. Now, again, uh, this is work that Helmut did, but he, what he found is that when you started actually trying to look at realistic human solvable problems, uh, they're typically MP hard. We don't actually use the expressiveness that we've got available. But still, MP hard is kind of still not somewhere that you want to be continually going back to and trying to find solutions. Um, so when something happens to invalidate a plan, which is going to happen on a regular, regular basis, we can't waste time trying to resolve. And it, even if it's MP hard, we can't try and waste that time solving this MP hard problem. It's just not a good use of time. Didn't fix the builds on that one either. Um, so the way that we get around this is to uh, take uh, the clustering that we've done and say, well, OK, we've done some clustering. And we've got these nodes smushed together and colored in blue. And really, what we could do is we could represent that as one giant blue node and get an abstract representation of the problem. So our little problem that we were working with with blues and reds becomes, well, I've got blue. And then I know that I'm going to go through purple. And then I know that I've got a big thing of red. And what we've done is we've implicitly created a horizon within the problem and made it quite abstract. And then we can say, OK, well, we know what we need to do in general. We need to do blue, purple, red. So how do we get to purple? Let's look in the blue cluster. So we can plan inside that cluster, concretize out the actions, and leave everything else at a pretty abstract level. And what that means is that we're minimizing the amount of work that we're going to do on the MP, hide, MP hard side of things um, and, and making sure that what we're going to throw away, the stuff that's going to go bad, is as minimal as possible. Because we know that if we try and work out what's happening in the red cluster, no point at all. We're not going to get there the way we expect to, or we may not get there the way we expect to. Uh, so horizons and search space size. So this is um, a, a representation of how this is actually helping to constrain the problem. So if we start from an initial state here and we do just a straightforward search trying to solve a problem, then we might find the goal is down there. Fair enough. Uh, that's pretty much a, just a straightforward kind of planning way of solving it. If we add in focal nodes, then what we'll be trying to do is solve to the first focal node, which may only be a space of about that size. And then we'll go again from the focal node and try and solve to the next focal node, which is a space of that size. And then we can go to the goal. So what we're doing is, we're, because we're chopping up the length of the plan, or the length of the plan that we're actually trying to do at once, we're getting this kind of uh, very much, much more constrained search space to work with. And that is very much a good thing, because search space is kind of where planning falls down. So we've got a smaller search space, so that's good. But we still don't want our MPC standing around trying to work out what he's going to do. So having a smaller search space means we can solve the problem quicker, but we don't necessarily want to wait while we're solving that problem. So we need planning to happen off on one side uh, in the background and, and be an asynchronous process. And the way that we do that is to say, OK, whenever we've got new data coming in from the planner, we update the influence landscape appropriately. But we don't update it in the meantime. We can, and that gives us <coughs> uh, something that we can continue execution. We can carry on working with what we had before. Um, and this kind of brings us back to what we were talking about initially, which is reacting within the context of the goal. So contingencies. Essentially, what we're doing then is we're using uh, the influence landscape as a way of doing contingency planning and a way of implicitly finding contingencies 
within the search space. And the nature of the influence landscape is that when the influence propagates, the contingency is going to become, it's just, you're going to be able to see it straight away. So a quick example, let's say we've got a graph that looks like that, and there's our start state, there's our goal state. So it's a very simple graph because that's the only way it fits on one slide. Um, and that's what our plan has told us to do. We've, we're going to go that way. Uh, well, okay, fair enough, uh, but we set off going that way, we get to the first node, we have a look at, uh, at the next node, this one here, and we say, oh, we can't go there. Can't get through there, so uh, we need an alternative route. Well, we can see implicitly, just from the structure of the graph, we don't need to think, we can see that the influence here is radiating out down this path, and we can just come right up here, and there we go, we found a solution. So we've taken kind of the stuff that the planner has been telling us, we've taken the environmental data that we've received, we've combined them because we've got this common representation, and we've found ways to work around our um, uh, dynamic environment. So okay, in a bigger problem, how are we going to do that? So I said uh, a few slides ago that it wasn't search, so planners would try and search from A to B. What the influence landscape is going to give you is an evaluation technique, and its function evaluation is maths. You do your maths, and you can just see everything. And from there, what we're going to do is localized search. So if we're searching locally, then we can find good areas uh, within the uh, graph, and we can work out how to move about this graph. And we're going to be doing that informed by reaction and informed by deliberation. So in order to do that, you can use whatever search technique is, uh, is going to work for you, whatever you're most happy with. Uh, so a couple that I've been playing about with our neighborhood bounded A star and enforced hill climbing. But uh, essentially, if it's a local search technique, it should be able to uh, do this. But you need to have an efficient uh, local search algorithm or you're kind of backpedaling and, and missing the point. So, okay, so that is all of the theory. That's how it works on paper. So let's have a look at, at some of the results of what we've been doing. So um, here is a very simple graph that's been clustered. Um, so this is uh, from some early work. It's uh, from August, apparently. Um, so the graph, we've isolated the blue nodes. We've isolated the red nodes. We've isolated the green nodes. And we've found the purple. Uh, mucky sort of green and browny sort of green, and these guys here are the focal nodes lying between the clusters. Uh, so this is a, a very small graph, uh, but it does fit nicely on one slide, which is why I'm using it. Um, the the technique does generalize quite nicely, uh, as we can see on this uh, slide, which is from the journal paper we've got coming out sometime this year. I'm told we had it accepted in January of last year, so academic publishing for the win. Um, but these are a set of challenge problems that we created that are classified as easy, medium, and hard. Llama is a, at the time it was one of the state-of-the-art planners. I think it's falling out of favor a little bit now, uh, but this is what happens with journal delays. Um, but Llama is going to try and plan all the way from A to B, and uh, what we're going to have is 28 node expansions in order to get from A to B. We have an abstract solution in three node expansions. So we are able to get our MPC up and running and doing something that is likely to be useful with only three steps, whereas a planning agent needs 28. Moving on to the harder problems, here you can see that we've got 69 steps required for Llama, and we're talking about four or 11. So the techniques that we're throwing in, the abstraction, the horizon, and the clustering is actually giving us a, a very much quicker solution to getting up and running and getting the MPC actually doing something. So this is uh, work that I've been doing uh, very recently. This is uh, the last couple of weeks. And uh, I, I'm just going to drop out of the, the thing to just zoom in a little bit on this one, uh, although I've hidden my zoom behind a window. No, I haven't. Uh, okay, so this is Unity, uh, and oops, right. Okay, so this is Unity, um, and we've got a little game world here that's essentially a maze. Uh, there's a little robot, and there's a cube, um, 
and what we've generated, what I, I've been working on uh, that's just finished happening, uh, like I say, in the last couple of weeks, is this thing here, which is a system for automatically ticking out PDDL. And what it's going to do is it's going to look at the game world, it's going to figure out where everything is, uh, and it's going to uh, look at what's connected to what, uh, where the objects are in the game world, and it's updating dynamically, and this is a, a pretty quick process. So from there, we've got the game world generating PDDL, which we can fling over to the planner. So let me just drop back into the full screen mode. Uh, so uh, that's what we're doing at the moment. So uh, in terms of the future, what we've really shown is that this works on paper, and we've shown that it, it kind of works with toy problems. We haven't demonstrated that we can really make this work inside a game. So that's why I'm hacking it into Unity uh, and working on putting stuff like that together, is working towards showing that this works in games. Because being able to kick stuff off out on the command line, being able to do the maths and show on a whiteboard that it should work, isn't the same as actually showing you that this works. But what, would, what we can show is that we can, we're getting very close towards bridging the gap between reaction and deliberation. And that gives us realistic MPC reaction to player actions because we can quickly recompute everything, jiggle about with the influence landscape, and work out that this is what I should do in this situation. So we don't have to um, take the sort of slow, OK, the player's done that. How are we going to react? Uh, what does that, how does that impact on the long-term stuff? Uh, and it means that we get fast decision making. And from an academic point of view, from a, a more sort of classical AI point of view, we're reducing the reliance on replanning. We're reducing the number of times that we need to go back to solving this uh, piece based complete slash MP hard kind of problem. And that is definitely a good thing. So that's the end of the presentation. If you've got questions, uh, we'll be taking Q&A, I guess. Uh, uh, we're going to do that for 10 minutes. Uh, you can contact me here, my email address, luke at cis.strath.ic.uk. Um, I am always on Twitter, you can find me there, uh, at Luke D. If you want to learn more about the kind of research that we're doing, you can find that at this link, which is saig.cis.strath.ic.uk. Um, so that's got uh, stuff on the research group, and I try and keep it up to date with what everybody's up to. Um, and then lukedicken.com, that's my personal site. Uh, so yeah, that's that's me. Uh, any questions? I guess we can take them now. Thank you, Luke. <clears throat> so we don't have many questions, but several people have asked whether we will, uh, when are we going to make the materials available? So the answer is that we plan to make uh, the slides, the recordings, and any additional materials available at the ALDEFCONF website after the conference, hopefully sometime next week. So, Mike Acton is asking whether he can get a link to applying clustering techniques to reduce complexity in automated planning domains. Look. Luke, can you hear me? Sorry, I clicked on my mute button while I was letting <laughs> you talk, and I forgot to unclick it. Um, that's professional. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think Mike is talking about the journal paper. Uh, can you just read the title that he said again? Uh, okay, applying clustering. To, uh, the the thing is that I don't actually know. Uh, we've got two papers that are very similar, and one of them's embargoed at the moment, uh, and one of them isn't. And I can't work out which one it is that Mike's talking about. If, if he's asking for a link to it, I assume he's talking about the embargoed one. And um, the answer is that six months after it's published, we can release it. Uh, and like I said, as, a, uh, as I was going through it. it uh, we submitted it in January, had it accepted, and now 12 months later, 13 months later, we're still waiting for it to come out. And then we can, six months after it comes out, we can give it to you.
Yeah, uh, I am. <laughs> uh, I'll not read what Mike's put just there, but uh, I, I will agree with it. <laughs> so there's 116 of you. That somebody must have some questions. So yes, one of the questions from uh, is Luke, have you tried to connect with Bethesda, Bioware, etc., to try the technique within their next games? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, so uh, I was kind of down uh, several years into this before I sort of started being significantly well known within sort of game AI circles that I could even have contacts to do that. Um, but um, what we are looking at is uh, working with some student projects to, to put it in there um, and upcoming projects from the AI group are working with other people. Um, so uh, I can't sort of say who we're collaborating with um, but we are collaborating with some big name studios at the moment to try and get stuff into things that they'll have coming out maybe in 2013, 2014. Cool. So before that happens, is there, well, Mike is also asking whether, is there, whether there is any practical example that we can look at. Uh, give me a couple of weeks and there will be. Um, so everything is pretty much um, theoretical at, at this stage and uh, it's been on hold for the last couple of months while I was helping to organize the conference realistically. Um, which is why it was a couple of weeks ago that I nailed the PDDL generator. Um, but it's all uh, coming together and uh, maybe by the time it, uh, it gets published, uh, by the time the video for this gets published, maybe there will be, in which case I'll wander back to the comments section and make sure uh, that it comes out. So, a question from Alex. In case it didn't work, uh, what's the relationship between this and the reinforcement learning techniques? So, this has a lot of uh, similarities to a technique that works on, I've sort of tried to keep it a little bit out of machine learning uh, for the session, but uh, if you want to get hardcore about it, then what we're really talking about is sort of something that's very similar to uh, value iteration in hidden Markov models. Um, so uh, you take your, um, uh, sorry, Markov uh, decision processes, I guess. Um, so you, you can uh, do back propagation, I believe, on the Markov decision project process, uh, and that essentially comes down to uh, the same kind of sort of uh, processes propagating influence across an influence landscape. So there is a similarity there for sure. So Andrew is asking, does the influence flow only from the goal nodes or other nodes as well? Can you give examples? Uh, so, okay, so the influence flows in the, deli in the deliberative uh, stage, it flows from things, these focal nodes that I was describing. So these aren't goal nodes, they are nodes that the, that the plan was going to pass through. So it's kind of a, a chopped down, uh, let's say it's every third line of the plan, every fourth line of the plan becomes one of these focal nodes. Um, so that's on the deliberative side. On the reactive side, we wouldn't be talking about uh, the goal necessarily, but we uh, might be talking about still the same kind of thing with enemies and uh, health power-ups, but we'd be able to sort of sense, so from an NPC's point of view, uh, you might do uh, a, a quick uh, line of sight check and say, okay, I can see that there's a power-up on, on this location, so every uh, node within the graph is going, the, the, sorry, every node within the graph that represents uh, that location, or me being at that location rather, is going to be uh, positively affected. And that will direct, as the thing is trying to move around the graph, as it's uh, moving around the world, it's moving around the graph uh, sort of concurrently. Uh, and it will deform the plan, and it would say, okay, as I'm walking past here, it makes sense for me to take a sidestep, pick up this power up because I can see that that puts me in a better state for the rest of the graph. So, 
So another question from Andrew. And uh, we did the question from Andrew. Oh, no, one second. Hang on. Uh, I mean, sorry, another question from Dave. How did you go about weighting non-Boolean edge transitions in your planning graph? Does that affect your search capabilities? How, how did you non-Boolean edge transitions? So we don't have non-Boolean edge transitions is the thing. Uh, we're dealing strictly with Booleans. And the way that we're going to get around that for things that are continuous, so say health, is to take uh, fuzzy classifications. So we can say that uh, we have low health, we have medium health, or we have high health. Uh, if we were trying to actually do um, proper continuous uh, stuff, it's possible in planning using uh, a technique called fluence. Uh, but fluence are it's pretty miserable, and it's not really uh, going to going to work very well. So sticking with booleans is definitely the way forward, uh, and jiggling about with non-boolean stuff to make it into booleans is the way that we're dealing with that. Okay. So another question from Mike. Have you applied to uh, any non-AI network? Have you applied this uh, approach to any non-AI network? Uh, I don't understand how it, what it means by non-AI network. Just like a general... Uh, general graph, kind of problems, I guess. Uh, no, is the answer. That one was short. Uh, I mean, it probably has some bearing, but I would guess that there's probably, like, the, the trick to this, the, the thing that makes it important, isn't really sort of flowing around the network. That's not necessarily new. It's getting the network, so it's flowing around the network that represents concepts rather than uh, sort of flowing around, uh, say, uh, a computer network representation. So the question from Ross, uh, this solution seems to suggest an overlord that manipulates data that is general or important to all NPCs, and that all NPCs, and then the NPCs are to react to the influence map using a state machine or something. Um, not really. So uh, the edges within the influence uh, landscape correspond to different actions. So they are then plugged in. So I haven't really talked about how it's wired into the game world directly, but the edge corresponds to an action, and the action is the NPC moving forward or backwards or whatever, and, and that's where it gets wired in as a like state machine level, is that this um, fires off uh, actuators into the world. Uh, in terms of the overload point, uh, to an extent, the overload is internal to the, well, yes and no. I mean, the world representation has to be there um, uh, while, uh, so the, the sorry, the, the world representation has to be there. We have to know about things that are going to be uh, important to all NPCs, but it doesn't have to be a single thing driving um, all, of, uh, all of the NPCs. It can be distributed. It can be internal to just one guy.